ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this panel discussion number five uh, for the day, where we're going to be lo looking at uh, building sustainable partnerships for addressing the burden of NCD. We are aware that uh, the global efforts to fight the, the, the communicable diseases has actually uh, been a bit affluent and to some extent quick. Uh, uh, we've, we've learned lessons with combating the epidemics, uh, quick resource mobilizations, huge investments, but we know there is limited progress in realizing that uh, 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 NCD uh, needs also to be controlled. So we, we, we believe that uh, today, as we deliberate in this, uh, we, we will be able to see how do we uh, strengthen partnerships? How do we mobilize resources? How do we provide technical support? What are the drivers of things that can make us more effective? Uh, biomedical implementation science, what strategies? Uh, looking at government, communities, private sector, uh, looking at uh, uh, different stakeholders. How can they come in and, and help us reduce this burden? And we know it's a, a rising burden. Actually, in, in our settings, we have dual epidemic because we know that uh, at, at least for some things, 25% of our population being at risk or even having an NCD of some kind, that's really huge. If you compare it with an 8% for the HIV, but there's a discrepancy in resource allocation and in, in, in making sure that care or preventive measures, levels of awareness reach out to our population. So in this session, we want to discuss how we can actually build a strong, impactful, and sustainable uh, partnership that can help us address NCDs uh, in Africa. So uh, with me today, uh, my name is Isaac Sinabulia. I'm a cardiologist, uh, practice with the Uganda Heart Institute, but I also co-direct an initiative called the uh, Uganda Initiative for uh, Management of Non-Communicable Diseases, Integrated Management of Non-Communicable Diseases. Uh, and, 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 and most recently, we, we conducted uh, uh, a commission where we're looking at uh, NCD. One of the speakers will actually take us through that, what we've learned and what can be done. And our chair today is uh, Dr. Mutunji Gerard, who is the Assistant Commissioner uh, for NCD uh, at the Ministry of Health, and who also actually uh, has been the co-chair for this uh, uh, NCD commission. Dr. Gerard, uh, you're more than welcome to chair this session and take us through. Of course, now that you have the other uh, 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 speakers uh, sign in, uh, the, the, the schedule can change. Uh, we'll still have, uh, we can blend it and have, uh, 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 the, uh, I don't know, maybe them speaking first. You, you can advise at your discretion. Uh, such that we, we see how it flows. Uh, I had hoped that we can allow the Ugandan people speak one after the other to build that, uh, but uh, the international speakers can also come in. Uh, time is of the essence. We want to limit the talk or the discussions to a few minutes so that we can actually deliberate and have a discussion. Thank you so much. Gerard, you are welcome. Thank you very much, Isaac, and uh, good afternoon, colleagues. As you've heard, I'm Dr. Gerard Mutunja. I work here at the Ministry of Health, and you are welcome to this session. The Ministry of Health's perspective is that we value partnerships. We know that we can't do it alone. Uh, and indeed, most of the risk factors for NCDs don't fall under our mandate. The issues of alcohol, the issues of trade, uh, cigarettes, and, and all that, the nutrition issues, we are don't fall uh, under our mandate. Even the uh, environmental pollution, they fall elsewhere. So if you are to combat NCDs, we need the partnerships, the, the academic, the civil society, other sectors, uh, the business community. All of you are, are welcome to, to, to help the ministry and advise the ministry and give us strategies on how to combat uh, the non-communicable diseases. I'm happy that we have a mixture of local presenters and international presenters, and we are going to talk about how to build these partnerships, especially learning from our colleagues in HIV who have built strong partnerships and it seems to be working. So we want to learn from them. Uh, so I want to 
start with the, I think I will be mixing the international and, and local, and the, maybe I call them national, not local, because sometimes local has bad connotation here. Uh, I will start with uh, Dr. Richard Idro, and Dr. Richard Idro has a long CV, but allow me to summarize. Uh, Dr. Richard Idro is a consultant pediatrician and a pediatric neurologist at Uganda uh, Hospital, Monago National Referral Hospital, and is a senior lecturer at Macquarie University. He trained in medicine and general pediatrics at Macquarie University, obtained a PhD in clinical neuroscience from the University of Amsterdam, and trained in pediatric neurology with the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health at the Great Ormond Street Hospital in London. Dr. Idro joined the Uganda Medical Association as an intern doctor in 1995, and 1996 was elected Deputy Secretary General. He rejoined the National Executive Committee of Uganda Medical Association in 2015 as the chair of the Continuing Professional Development. It was during this time that Dr. Idro innovated the first Grand Doctors Conference and Doctors Fellowship Dinner that brought together doctors of all specialties under one room. In 2018, he led the first multidisciplinary camp that over one week offered specialized medical and surgical care at over 15,000 patients in West Nile. So Dr. Idro is not strange to partnerships. He knows how to make partnership with colleagues, but I hope we can build his experience even outside his colleagues. So Dr. Idro, Richard, you are our first presenter and the microphone is yours, thank you. Um, uh, good afternoon colleagues. Um, uh, Dr. Mtunji, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, Today, I would like to share with you our experiences in building research, uh, partnerships in conducting research. And I, I have taken a particular interest or particular area, and this is the partnerships we have had in solving the problem of nodding, uh, nodding syndrome and some of the lessons we have learned along the way. Um, many of you will recount that in the early, late, 2000 from around 2009 um, up to 2013-15, um, there was this huge problem of, um, of nodding syndrome in the northern parts of the country. Um, however, this problem has not been just in Uganda. Um, there were earlier cases reported in southern Tanzania um, um, near the Zambia border right down and uh, in uh, South Sudan. And it is now estimated that there may be more than 10,000 children affected. And, um, and, but there are also a few cases reported in Burundi and in the Democratic Republic of, um, of, of Congo. This disorder was first reported to Ministry of Health around 2009 and, um, and eventually made its way to, to parliament um, with the meeting of the actually parliamentary group and government of Uganda in 2011, when a compressive program was, was started. Um, I started hearing about it around 2010 and uh, 2011, by then I was, I was still completing my uh, neurology training and I got interested and did write to the ministry that maybe I will be able to help if I came, uh, when I came back. And I, when I came back towards the end of 2011, that's when I joined this, this program. And in 2012, we developed the first treatment guidelines and set up centers. And therefore started detailed studies to understand this, this disease. Um, what have we known over the years? That this disease goes through some five or so stages, initially starting with the prodromal period when these really young children, five to eight years, they become like um, they increasing in attention. They do not pay a lot of attention. And a few weeks later, they develop the classical head nodding. And thereafter, a year or so later, they start getting developing other uh, developmental disorders and, uh, and then complications of, of uh, 
of, of, the, of the disease, including severe epilepsy, and eventually they become uh, depleted. Right down here are three brothers. You can see one of them extremely short and wasted. This is a 13 year old child who, who, was, uh, the, who, who is of the height of a, of, of a five year old. Or right up is, is another child who is tied with a rope to, to a pole. This is a child, they go wandering around. And then down here, you have other children with uh, a lot of physical disabilities. Um, we have spent detailed uh, time to study this disease de in, in details. But working with the Ministry of Health and understanding these diseases, we developed guidelines for, for treatment. We trained health workers um, and set up treatment units across the, the region. And initially, no, not knowing what the cause is, we targeted uh, symptomatic, uh, symptomatic care. And especially looking at seizure control, behavior and psychiatric difficulties, developing nursing care, and nutritional, uh, nutritional rehabilitation, physical rehabilitation as, as these entities. Here is the first draft of the, um, an image of the first draft of the guidelines which we developed in 2012. A lot has changed since then. And uh, with these initial treatments, the children started improving. And uh, so we, we did set out to understand what the causes of nodding syndrome are. At that time, we asked ourselves three questions. Is this disease caused by a toxin, whether and in food, whether and in the environment, in water, or is it a genetic disorder, or is it caused by an infection? What was clear was that the disease appeared from around 1997. Before that, that disease was not there in that community. So it was very difficult for this to be a genetic disease because if it was a genetic disease, the older people will understand it. But working with the US Centers of Disease Control, now I'm starting about the partnerships, um, we had a genetic uh, sequencing, full exon sequencing of a child in Uganda and then another child in the US. Then we had also generations, a grandfather, um, the parents, the children and grandchildren. And the children were the ones who had nodding syndrome. And then one of them had a child. And uh, all these children were, uh, all these participants were, they were taken to the US and their genetic um, makeup sequenced. And no uh, unique genetic abnormality was, was identified. In a later study working with the the UCL, the University College London Neurogenetics Unit, again, that's another, the next partner, we conducted extensive um, uh, genetic studies to determine whether there are any unique genes which have been associated with neurological disorders. Again, we did not identify any particular element. Then the other one is, is there an, a toxin, whether in the environment, in chemicals, in food? First, again, starting with uh, the US Centers of Disease Control, um, there was an extensive survey of, of water sources, of food, of uh, environment, even soil samples which were taken. And then urine samples, hair samples from these in the different individuals to try to determine whether there were any heavy metal poison, heavy metal poisoning. <coughs> um, My apologies. So heavy metal poisoning, looking at especially arsenic and, um, and lead and the theocyanates. And really there was nothing in that relation. We then conducted uh, quite a number of genetic studies, um, um, not genetic studies, but post-mortem studies, <clears throat> looking at the brain samples. Is this a prion disease imaging? and a lot of these detailed things. And there was no indication that it was a prion disease. The next was to identify infections, viruses and um, parasites. And really there was no clear identification, but working with the vector control division in the Ministry of Health, we mapped all these children. And here we have the different images and each black dot is a child on, um, on, on my right, 
which um, which may be on your left is um, children with epilepsy, and then on the other end, uh, children with uh, nodding syndrome. And we identified each home and their locations on GPS, um, all these areas. But what was interesting was all these this, this, uh, persons were along the, the small rivers, the streams, and they, they mostly lied around the areas where the simulian fly was, was breeding. And what is known about the simulian fly is that they transmit onchocerciasis. And from our surveys, very many of these children had very high densities of uh, microfilaria of onchocerca volvulus in their skin. And almost all of them um, had the high levels of antibodies. That was the first association that it, we started thinking that this thing may be related to onchocerca volvulus. And so we did inform government and working with the Ministry of Health, government started the interventions, um, mass drug administration with ivermectin every October and every um, April. And, um, and since then, the disease prevalence of onchocerciasis went down significantly. In 2015, I was then awarded um, a medical um, research fellowship, um, a leadership award by the Medical Research Council. And we then set to now really look at the pathogenesis of this disease, conducting a clinical trial and testing whether doxycycline can be used for treatment and detailed case, um, case control studies. So here we were working with the University of Oxford looking at antibodies and our hypothesis was that nodding syndrome may be an, in, an, a neuroinflammatory disorder where you are infected by this parasite and um, the body reacts to it, but the, the parasite has a similar antigenic makeup with a protein in the brain. And then with the cross reaction with the brain, um, you may have such injury. And already we have a lot of preliminary um, uh, results to suggest that actually this, this, is, this is the case and we are finishing these this areas. We have had a multiple number of um, partnerships. So we have been working with um, in Belgium with two universities, um, the University of Ghent. So we had PhD students from there looking at pharmacology, understanding how do they react to different uh, drugs. And then from Antwerp, the global center with the neurobiology uh, department. I already mentioned the US Centers of Disease Control um, University of Bonn in, um, in Switzerland, um, of course, the University of Oxford, which was the main center and which still continues to be the main center, genetics from the University College London Neurogenetics Unit. And then we've been working with the Kenya Medical Research Institute and the Uganda Virus Research Institute, looking at uh, proteomics and trying to understand which part of the protein of this Onkosaka volvulus is similar to that in the brain and on which it may um, react. And uh, currently we have additional uh, collaborations with the University of Bologna in, uh, in, in India, sorry, in uh, Italy and the University of Amsterdam. And then of course, most of this work is based at Kidgum General Hospital. So the district identified one old building which we renovated and it has become our research center. And in Makere, we have multiple masters and PhD students who are conducting this thing. And how has this one been um, possible? Um, we, in each of these countries, what we, as we started doing this work, different individuals became interested. And um, although our resource envelope was relatively small, we were able to take small parts of this study and collaborate with individuals in uh, different areas so that they provide, um, their lab infrastructure or the skills infrastructure or human resource infrastructure, and they will collaborate with us. And then they pick a particular area. For example, the uh, University College, uh, uh, the University of California, San, Fr San Francisco, they have an epilepsy surgery unit. So they have been helping us with looking at the images. We brought these children here in Mengo, um, just in the in a Kampala MRI center. So all of them had brain imaging done in detail. And these images uh, using telemedicine, um, we have been able to transfer a lot of the images to California and the epilepsy center in California has been looking at this, uh, these images. 
we have been engaging the different bodies. So wherever we went on conferences and made presentations, individuals who are either doing similar work or who could benefit this work, um, we have been collaborating with them, that we have these resources, whether they are blood samples, whether a place where students can come and train, especially those who are doing similar work, willing partners who could provide both resources and human resource. But many of these partnerships do take time. They do not, they do not just come the other day. Um, the first funding was a very small amount of funding um, from the Waterloo Foundation is a charity in Wales. They provided that funding for us to do the initial uh, work. But using that small thing, we have been able to leverage. For example, the Medical Research Council eventually gave us 750,000 uh, uh, pounds, which I was submitted to Makere University as the grant holding institution and to University of uh, um, uh, Oxford. And between them, these two institutions have then been able to do this. But now with time, all these different in individuals, uh, all institutions have been able to put uh, money and time. So trust that whatever we have been given is used very effectively and it comes out. We started in 2011. And this is now uh, 10 years down, down the road. And then of course, perseverance. And since then, our lessons have been translated. For example, the Sudan evangelical mis missionaries have, had, have been coming over to learn how have we done it in Uganda. Uh, the research site in, in, um, in Kidgum has now become a training center for the London School of Hygiene. And even the University of Oxford also sends students to this and also Makere University. So different areas of individuals, everybody putting their part has been able to bring this um, together. And it has been each, in the, each group picking like a jigsaw, an area and fitting it in. One was to associate the disease with Onkosaka volvulus and the Ministry of Health immediately took charge of that. The president went and, uh, and launched aerial spraying in the area mass drug administration by the vector control division. We had post-mortem studies, detailed lab studies, imaging, EEGs, brain MRIs, and uh, proteomics, all different um, individuals. But we have also been able to leverage multidisciplinary you can, care. You have two minutes to conclude your presentation. Okay. Um, we have been able to leverage multidisciplinary care in Uganda. We have been working with psychiatrists, nurses, orthopedic surgeons, um, uh, or, um, uh, physiotherapists, really different individuals. And uh, since then, the epidemic went down. And um, I want to confidently tell you that to, this is now the sixth year that we have not had a single new case of nodding syndrome. All the cases which we now have are the ones who developed the symptoms long ago. They are continuing. And it is, it is one of the most amazing interventions which we have, uh, we have had. And that is why, as I say, you will no longer see these things appearing in the groups which have been able to leverage this partnership and, um, and go to other areas. And it is using these models that we have now gone to other areas. We are starting at stroke in sickle cell disease. Of course, we have now almost sorted out nodding syndrome next year, uh, either end of this year or next year, we'll release all the results. But we're also looking at different viral encephalitis which are appearing and the effects of severe malaria in uh, children. This work has been by large teams of very young people who have been working in this. And in the background is uh, their picture but funded by so many different organizations, including the government of Uganda, for which uh, we are uh, very, 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 very grateful. And uh, it's these experiences which we'll be able to discuss further. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Richard. That was very insightful, uh, using different partners, universities, policymakers, but even within the academia using multidisciplinary teams uh, to solve a problem, to solve a puzzle of nodding syndrome. I visited the, the nodding syndrome sites there in 2012 and I shed tears seeing those uh, young children. Some of them would be tied on the rope and tied on a, a tree 
as their parents went to go and they look for food. So that's very, very insightful. I, I want us to use something like that also to explain why, for example, in Uganda, we have diabetes in lean, very active uh, people in rural areas, they still get diabetes and hypertension. So probably we could learn from that. Thank you. And those with questions, please, we have the question and answer uh, chat room. You can put your question there. Or if we have some time, we shall allow you to, to ask some questions. Uh, I now want to go to our international uh, presenter, Dr. Uwebok. Dr. Uwebok has a, again a rich CV, but I will summarize it. He's, he's, he has a PhD and is the head of sales for Eastern and Western Africa of Siemens. Her years based in Dubai. From there, he manages relations to health service providers in Uganda, Nigeria, Ghana, Kenya, Ethiopia, and Tanzania. Additionally, he develops collaborations with African universities and drives relations with the international organizations. Since 2008, he has held several positions in the sales with responsibilities for different regions and customers. For that, he held positions in business management and engineering in several companies. He studied elect electric engineering at Kane University, Great Britain, where he finished his PhD thesis in 1995. You are most welcome to tell us about collaborations, especially now that you are from a private sector and the microphone is yours. You are most welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think I have a short, short echo here. Uh, let's let's switch to the presentation. So thank you, thank you, thank you much, very much again. My name is as you, as you mentioned. My name is my name is Uwe Borg. I'm very pleased to speak to you to speak to you today uh, about about Siemens and how how Siemens can support the fight against N N C NCDs. So if we are looking if we are looking for First of all, if you're looking, I was very impressed with the, with the presentation of my of my previous previous of the previous speaker, Richard Idro. I think it's fantastic what has been achieved there, and I was happy to hear that again. Imaging equipment played a role in in, sol in solving these uh, so solving or help helping the, the patients with regard to the nodding syndrome. When we when we are talking when we are talking about NCDs, I think. Uh, here are some statistics, and what we what we see here on the on the left hand side causes of of deaths in a death in Africa, and I think the encouraging thing is here when we are talking about inf infectious diseases is that HIV seems to be uh, slowly decreasing, which is a great success, but at the same time we see two two important uh, two important causes of death increasing. That is cardiovascular diseases. And we are and we are seeing cancer increasing. And if you look where cancer is coming from, you're expecting that cancer will be unfortunately more and more more and more relevant in the future. When we're looking at the right hand side, we are seeing the costs of deaths uh, projected by the WHO, and we see by the year of 2030 that almost half of the causes of death in in Africa will be caused by by non-communicable diseases, and by the by the looking at the trend, it will it will even become a larger portion. Before we talk what uh, before we talk about uh, how we can best support, let me let me give you one uh, some information about Siemens as a whole, and this is this is what this is about Siemens and and about Siemens Health and Years. First of all, I think I want to draw your attention. We are we at Siemens Health and Ears, uh, 66,000 employees working at Siemens Health and Ears and working for the uh, to improve healthcare. We are based in 70 countries, and and we and we are serving an installed base. The installed base means systems of more than 600,000 systems currently running from Siemens Health and Ears worldwide, and our revenue just on the top here, is around 14.5 14, 14. billion euro, 
plus an, an additional $3.2 billion dollar revenue. Why is this important? It is important because we are reinvesting a large part of our, of, of our profit in, in making the systems better. So we are investing more. This gives us the possibility to invest more than 1 billion euro every year in making the systems more precise, which is very important in detecting and detecting and, and investigating the NCDs, making it more economical so a wider, wider range of population has access to the, to, to our, to the systems and made it easier and better to use. So improving the work, uh, the, 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 uh, the past, the treatment path. And I think this is something where, where we are working on why, and this is, makes it very important for, for the community. When we are talking, when we are talking about, when, when, we, are, when we are talking about what we have to offer, then you can see here, and then you can see here that we are offering, we, are off, we have a broad portfolio with regards, and this is a, I must say, a unique portfolio with regards to NCD. First of all, I think most of you will be aware that diagnostic imaging is something we actually haven't been, we have been doing for, for, a, long, for a long time. Our first, our first MR was more than 30 years ago. Uh, CTs even even longer. So we are, and and here you can see only a couple of just to mention some commuted com, uh, CTs. So computed tomography, magnet resonance, molecular imaging, and such. Then, if you be, go to the right, is we have ultrasound. Uh, ultrasound because that is, as you as as you know, that is the uh, the it, it, it's used almost everywhere in in local clinics. Advanced therapies. With angios, uh, angio suites, cath labs, and so on, laboratory diagnostics, which, which uh, Richard Idro mentioned as well, with blood analysis, and I think here on the right you can see you can see that Varian that we have as we have a, that we have acquired, as you might all know, we have acquired Varian a short time ago, so to complete uh, uh, the portfolio, our portfolio, and that we are able to. Uh, to, to provide a holistic solution to in the fight of NCDs. Not to not to forget the both points on the on the bottom. Customer service is for us essential. There is only a system is which is running and which is serving the public is a good system. So therefore, we are taking pride in in having having uh, or having service for the 600,000 600, systems which are employed worldwide. And here it comes as well as a very important point for us, value, value partnership. Partnership, that means that we are not only providing technology, but it, as well supporting in consulting, knowledge access, design planning, and so on. Let, let, let's, let's now talk, talk to what, what is it all about. And I have, I have, brought, I have brought with you uh, I've brought with me um, a, breast, uh, a pathway of, of breast health, the journey of breast, breast health. And that is something where, where we can see as well, where, where I want to show how, how we are supporting the whole, uh, the whole pathway from, from detection to uh, diagnosis to monitoring and follow up. So let's start in the middle. So first of all, as we know with communicable diseases, that it is key to detect to detect the disease as early as possible. The earlier we detect the case, the more likely it is that we that it's able to be that it's that it's that, that can be treated successfully. And for the for the for the for the screening, which takes an important role here, we are supplying we are supplying technology for mammography, ultrasound, and MRI. Once something is found and, and it, it's then a diagnosis is necessary. And so support, uh, additionally to MAMO ultrasound and MRI, we are supporting the, the technology of biopsy and PET CT, SPECT CT. Once it needs to be treated, then we are supporting the treatment monitoring plan with, with, with here 
to point it out, radi radiation therapy. This is the, this, this is the, these are the variant uh, acce linear accelerators, which are an integral part of our portfolio. And so we are, we are able to support. And once this is done, then the information then, of course, the follow up with imaging, lab value, with the, uh, with the repeatedly uh, diagnosis of the, of the blood samples and the, it is performed and all this information will be stored, will be stored in an electronic health record. And then, and this is basically a continuum here, which we are, which we are, which we are supporting and which has been implemented in already in, 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 in many cases in Africa. One thing, one, two, two projects I would like to highlight, just to mention them is you, uh, Uganda Cancer Institute. There is a there is a, a linear accelerator installed, and they are they're using uh, Siemens Siemens imaging equipment uh, for yeah, for diagnosis and treatment. Additionally, which which is another very very important successful project, is the project in Ethiopia. There's a national a national cancer cancer program where again multiple linear accelerators are deployed de deployed in Ethiopia. And being being and the the deployment is supported by the by by Siemens Health and Earth planning planning systems. Additionally, of course, we are offering we are offering other other services like training and so on. So when when we are but but this is as you said this is a complex this is a complex solution, and we are we can we can we can do our part to support this. But I think to really make it work uh, make it work, we need. We need to have we have, we need partnerships, and when we're talking partnerships, then here are a couple of a couple of key key people or key institution where we need to uh, where we need to coordinate with and work working together with. And here it's clear for us it's clear that only a multidisciplinary approach can lead to success. When I'm saying what can we bring in? We can bring in the technology, we can bring in our international knowledge, we can bring our international experience from, uh, from other countries. As I said, we are based, we are, we are, we have direct, direct legal entities in more than 70 countries. But I think it's very important that we are working very closely together with the Ministry of Health, with academia, financing, financing and other international organizations, manufacturers like, like us, and healthcare providers, and only if we are, if we can form, and if we if we can form a partnership, then I think then we can we, we can we can have success in in fight in, in fighting the the NCDs. And for that, I think we are we are as well welcome to to talk to you how what what can what can be done what the what the what the challenges are. We want to learn from you what your local challenges are to be able to support you in the best possible way. And in doing this, then we, are, we believe that then we can, we can create a holistic partnership which is needed to find the NCDs, to fight the NCDs. Will it be an easy way? No, for, for sure it will not. But I think it is, it is, a, a path, this is a path we are forced to go together, and we are, I think, we are aiming to go to go together in able to to fight the this NC, NC, the NCD burdens of the future. That means that by having, first of all, future future proof design planning, cutting edge cutting edge medical technology, a financial solution where where I think. Different partners have worked together to find to find uh, to to define what is needed and what can be done. Education and skill management, where we are able to support with with present face to face training, but as well to, to from a as well by a by by online training, structured online training. So we have our own portal where we can where we can do this, where we can. Uh, where we can define curriculums and so on, then equipment operations management, where where you can where, where you can 
have to define at a center where you can find where is which equipment needed, what is the status of equipment, where do we need more, where do we need more, where the short and so on. Digital platform to share data. Health, healthcare advisory, so how can things be improved? Then, of course, here we are relying on the medical medical expertise, which is which is crucial in this partnership. And, and, and governance and performance management. That means that once you have all these places in place, you have to sh you have to be sure that all the resources which have to be put into work work efficiently and with the with the lowest downtime and with the high with, with with the highest use to the public. And with this, and if we can create a partnership like this, then. We are we are very optimistic that we can we can we can provide a big contribution to so, uh, to to fighting the NCDs. And with this, I can I can only invite you all. Please come to us, speak to us, and let's discuss which steps we can take to constantly to continuously build up the capabilities in the fight of NCDs. And with this. I would I, I would like to, I would I would like to close, and uh, yes, and other things. The, at a later stage, we are going to have a number of questions. Hopefully, thank you very much. Thank you very much for that uh, presentation. Uh, I'm wondering why that technology is not ready really available here. Is it because of the skills, the human resource skills, or the cost? And how can we partner with you to ensure that such a technologies are with us here? For the benefit of our people, you think yes, about I think that, yes, I think let's let, let's define together what what we can do, what we can do and at what stage we can define a timeline. We can, as I said, we can support with educational skills, and and as as we have done with with a partnership with two uni, with two universities, and let's talk about it. Okay, thank you very much. Our next speaker is Dr. Maggie Chigozi. Dr. Maggie Chikozi is a Ugandan medical doctor, surprisingly, because I have known her as a business a guru and a corporate, in a corporate organization. And I'm, I'm just knowing that she's actually a medical doctor, but I've known her as a business consultant, an educator, and a, a sportswoman. She's a consultant at the United Nations Industrial Development Organization, UNIDO. She formerly served as executive director of Uganda Investment Authority from 1999 to 2011. The following one year internship in Uganda, she migrated to Zambia in, South, in, in Zambia, in Southern Africa, where she practiced as a physician from 1977 to 1979. She returned to Uganda in 1979, following the removal of Idamin from power but had free to neighboring Kenya after Milton Obote seized power in 1980. She continued to practice medicine in Kenya until 1986, when she again returned to Uganda following another change of government in Kampala. She worked as a physician to members of the parliament of Uganda and their families from 86 until 94. She has been reported to have had passion for pediatrics during her medical career. In 1994, she joined Crown Portal as Uganda Limited, manufacturers of Pepsi. Unfortunately, that is something we need to fight because it contributes to NCD, Dr. Maggie. As a marketing director, during her tenure at Crown Bottlers, she was appointed board member of Uganda Manufacturers Association. She worked at the bottling company until she was appointed executive director at Uganda Investment Authority in 1999. She's the first person and the She's the first woman to serve in that position at Uganda Investment Authority. So Maggie, tell us more about these partnerships and why you promote Pepsi, which is causing non-communicable diseases. You are most welcome, Maggie. Oh, please, un mute. please unmute, Maggie. Please un unmute, thank you. You I need to sorry. unmute, Maggie. I have done that. I wanted to start with that last one. We have just brought Pepsi Max, which has no sugar at all. And secondly, if you're an energetic young person, there's no reason why sugar should, I think, 
be damaging to you, but uh, we can discuss that. Um, yes, successful partnerships for communicable diseases. I want to thank uh, the previous two speakers. I love the fact that uh, we've gotten, we're beginning to get rid completely of nodding disease. Those children used to make me cry every day on TV. I want to thank Siemens bringing the new world next generation technology to Africa. We appreciate that as well. Um, COVID, COVID has uh, really woken us up uh, and also been very, very exciting, attracted all the partnerships you can imagine. And uh, we, on top of AIDS, which as well we saw in the same way, the chairman spoke about this, um, all the support that has been given to AIDS and we are seeing the figures coming down. And uh, even the government uh, focusing on those uh, the communicable diseases and uh, really as uh, Gerard, our chair said, uh, some of them, they, they are not even uh, uh, looked at as a health issue. Some of the NCDs, which is unfortunate. I think maybe that's one thing we need to, to change um, because they, they are, we feel bad when we, we have them. Um, we, I was uh, chairperson last year, of the Global Fund CCM local board, and I want to say Global Fund as well is another one that is excited about the communicable diseases. We supported malaria, TB, and HIV AIDS. And we did this with partners who are donors who raise the funds. And these, the partners who do this, belong to the public sector, private sector, civil society, development partners, just as the, 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 what uh, Mr. Bok, Dr. Bok put up right now the partnerships he needs. Again, ourselves here locally on the Global Fund Board uh, had the same structure. We had the government, Minister of, of Health, and we had uh, civil society organizations which ensure implementation and identify challenges, local challenges. And we had uh, you know, the private sector, which I was representing, and uh, our development partners. So, Unlike COVID and HIV AIDS, which does not allow anyone else to be comfortable, the NCDs are personal. You know, I have diabetes. You, you are my neighbor, you couldn't care less. You are my doctor, well, I hope you care. But uh, so that is a problem for NCDs. Uh, we, we saw, for example, when truck drivers came from Kenya, and you can see where our main disease, COVID disease is, it was on the route even up to Kulu on the way to, to South Sudan. Uh, so you can see that what damage communicable disease can do so quickly. But NCDs, you are on your own. Uh, it is a lifestyle generally, most things, and uh, you can handle the top, the top five, for example, diabetes, cancer, hypertension, and AIDS disease. But even as we say that, NCDs kill more people. We saw the figures that uh, Bok has just put up. Uh, we, we know 74% of deaths can be due. They were in 2014. This has changed a little bit to NCDs. 33% deaths attributed to just the top five NCDs. Cancer, uh, cardiovascular disease, uh, health, uh, respiratory, chronic like TB, substance abuse. So what should these sustainable partnerships for NCDs look like? I want to take it at the country level first. I see yourselves, Mr. Chair, Minister of Health as very, very critical. And it's important that the staff and the, the, the people we have there are professionals. Medicine takes you many years to learn. So you just don't pull me from from marketing and say, you, you go and be the PS in the Ministry of Health. So I think it's important that the people who are there are professionals and they are trained. Uh, NCD and Injuries Commission, we heard from them earlier today, to look at the data, give reports, so that we can track NCDs. This is very important uh, at the country level. Then, of course, for budgets, we need the Ministry of Finance 
and to coordinate donor fund. Hopefully we get our partners to provide funding, more funding as well for NCDs. Local government is terribly important to follow up when uh, drugs arrive in the, in the district. The chief medical, district medical officer is under local government, as is the cow. And these are the people that we are depending on down at the grassroots to ensure that the drugs that we bought, that we spent, are. so these people need to be part of the partnership. The other one is the Ministry of Gender. Critical. Women are 51% of this population and often they are the ones left behind. So how do we ensure gender is a part of this partnership? Uh, ICT, critical. You are moving uh, chairman to, towards e-health, e which is excellent. You need good connectivity, software and others. You need the national ID, so that somebody should, NIRA should continue with their work so everybody has an ID and you can then follow them up with the medical uh, data and uh, computers that we are hearing about from Siemens. Um, the medical personnel, important, the caliber, the training they receive, the facilitation, we hear we are not very well paid. No, we don't hear, we know we are not very well paid uh, and the remuneration. Then we must look at the drug storage and distribution and accountability. So those are people that we need in this uh, group of uh, people that are going to form a partnership to ensure that our people uh, with NCD actually benefit. Research is critical. We've just heard from nodding disease uh, here, doctors, academia, and of course they use IT and, and, and various technology to be able to do that. So that's an important component. And communication. I think Uganda as a country, we do not communicate very well. No, in very few things. I think COVID, we've had to do well. Uh, everybody now knows about, uh, about COVID and what you need to do about it. But for NCDs, the lifestyle change is easy. I mean, I just need to do some exercise. I just need to eat better. Uh, but who has told me down there in the village? No one. So it's important that government, Ministry of Health, improves this communication. And this can be through uh, the media, through publicity, the radio, TV, print. And nowadays we have social media, which gets to the, all the young people and they can pass on the message to their families. So media is an important part of this partnership that we need to form. And to complete this, it's very difficult, as we heard from one of the presenters this morning, that if you need a budget, your Ministry of Health, you will go to finance and they'll tell you they don't have money. Right? This, whatever you need is really critical, it's so important, but they'll say they don't have money. So as part of this partnership, we need the Prime Minister to coordinate it so that the voice of the, the, the boss in, in, in government is able to, to insist, even when finance is saying there's no money, they must find money for the important things. Um, and then uh, parliament, of course, if it requires changing a law or requires more funding, budget uh, reallocation or something. And lastly, we in the private sector, what we found worked for us, that whole system I've just given you, we have the same thing in the private sector with different organizations, of course, that we need, but it is chaired eventually after we do all the work, we report back to the president. And this is the presidential investor roundtable. Bringing the president on board means that these things can be done. We report again after six months and those who have not done what they were supposed to do can end up in trouble. So that is the structure. It is the global fund structure and uh, uh, for us as presidential investor roundtable in the private sector it worked very well but we also need our partners the un sdg3 all the other sdgs all have a health component so they are very useful they give us information they give, they suggest ideas and uh, they give you technical expertise so those are the other partner that we must have global information, we learn best practices. Uh, I remember now with the pandemic, 
Dr. Cedros uh, at the UN, but locally our own Dr. Jonas is keeping us briefed about what is happening. UN Women, UNAIDS and others. And most importantly, I know the book is looking at me, the private sector, the private sector. We are the pharmacies in Uganda, those are the busiest people. Every patient first goes to the pharmacy, tries the pharmacy, and then he may go to the hospital, of which 60% are here, are private. Uh, then manufacturing, we produce a large number of drugs and other equipment and PPEs. Uh, training, we have private nursing schools, private medical schools. Uh, we do give donations like we did for COVID. My own company, we did give two pickups and I think a, a billion shillings or so. Uh, we do have expertise that we provide to government, like our Pricewaterhouse Coopers to do accounts and uh, audits and things like that. Of course, the Minister of Health must retain his regulator role, must set the standards for the private sector in the health sector. The one that you always forget, the money that the Minister of Finance is giving to, to the Ministry of Health, we produce most of it. We pay taxes. And this is what goes to, uh, to support all the public hospitals in the country together with the donor fund. We also give jobs. You had, I think, book, you have 66,000 jobs. Is that what I had? Wow, that is huge. So jobs. And we also invest in research, uh, especially the, 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 those in civil society are critical. They are down there at the grassroots. I think we must be running out of time. I'm about to finish. Uh, civil society hear from the communities. They report back. They tell you who has been left behind, who has not been able to access drugs. We have a lot of uh, parts of the, our community that are vulnerable right now. The, 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 the young girls below 18 are the ones most new cases of HIV AIDS. That is such a sad thing. So if we don't pay attention, our girls are going to get HIV AIDS at that very young age. But civil society points it out to you very, very clearly, as they do when they stock out. Uh, so they're very important for us to have on. They can be annoying, they quarrel, they, they, they advocate seriously, they report you all over, but I think that's not always bad. And then we have our traditional funders, our donors, and uh, the ones who gave us for COVID, we had, thank you very much from, from very many sources. So to complete government, again, uh, the prime minister, the president, parliament, um, and what we have now, what's coming is the national dialogue. This is best for NCDs, where it is about individual uh, lifestyle change. One of the important pillars of the national dialogue is, uh, is health. And here we identify issues and discuss important issues, bringing on board even the people of Uganda in general and report back annually to the annual national dialogue. So I want to end here by stressing communication. Communication, people need to know more about NCDs and how to prevent them. And also the partnership I suggested is what I think will help us as a country, as Uganda, to, to move ahead. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Maggie, for that wise counsel and emphasizing some of the very important stakeholders that we must bring on board. One question before you leave, Maggie, it was possible to form the Global Fund for Malaria, Tuberculosis, and HIV AIDS. Why is it not possible to form a Global Fund for control of NCDs? <laughs> Since they are killing more yes. people, it's a problem. <laughs> I am not the Global you, Fund. You so can be the first contributor. <laughs> I think they should be. I think they should take it up. We lose so many people, they die because of this. And less people are now dying from the others. So it's about time they began to move on. We haven't impacted TB as well as we would wish. I think we can remove, kick TB out completely to zero. Uh, but yes, NCDs should be a part of what the Global Fund supports. 
I hope, Maggie, when we come with a basket, you will put something for control of NCDs in Uganda. Thank you very, very much. And the people may have some questions. Uh, so stay with us. Our good audience, I think we have many people who are listening to us. Please, if you have any comments or any question, please let us know. Put them in our Q and A. We shall be able to read them. Our next speaker is Dr. Anne Acting. Dr. Anne Acting also has a rich CV, but I will summarize it for the because of time. Uh, serves as a deputy director of UINCD. UINCD is itself a partnership, so she's the right person to talk. It's a Uganda-based research partnership between faculty at Makerere University College of Health Sciences, at Yale University School of Medicine in the US, Mago National Federal Hospital, and the Uganda Ministry of Health Program for Control and Prevention of Non-Communicable Diseases. She's a public health expert in non-communicable diseases in Uganda and provides mentorship and project support to UINCD scholars and fellows. Dr. Anna Teng, you are welcome to address this uh, audience. We have over 50 people waiting to listen to you. Thank you. Dr. Ann, if you have started, you are muted, so you need to unmute. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Gerald, and thank you, everybody. I'm happy to be speaking to you once again, for those who were with us in the morning session. And it's nice to speak after the gurus of partnerships have talked a lot about partnerships. So mine will just be to highlight how partnerships have helped us to implement this um, Uganda NCDI Commission, NCDs and Injuries Commission, but importantly to reflect on how the rich experience we've had from different speakers and their partnerships and programs can enrich NCDs. I guess it's more for all of us who are NCD stakeholders. So as mentioned, I'm Dr. Anna Kiteng and I work with the Uganda Initiative for Integrated Management of Non-Communicable Diseases. As you can see in the opening slide, I need to put it on PowerPoint mode. Um, this work was handled by Ministry of Health, UINCD as co-hosts and supported by the Global Lancet NCDI Commission, Partners in Health, NCD Sign and NCD Synergies. I, I can't go to PowerPoint mode, but I hope people are able to see. So the report is titled Reframing NCD, NCDs and Injuries in the Era of Universal Health Coverage. So as we are looking at the gaps, it's important to reflect as a country and also as the world moving towards sustainable development goals that's looking at access to health for everybody we should be thinking critically about the elements of, um, or have the elements of universal health coverage at the back of our minds. So I'll just briefly give highlights of the NCDI um, commission data sources. We used key findings, recommendations, and reflections on the partnership. So the NCDI commission was sanctioned by Ministry of Health in 2019, and we lodged in August. And so we've been doing this work collaboratively with different partners involved ever since. And um, from what has already been mentioned or from what we know, NCDIs are now a major cause of morbidity, mortality, and they are rapidly rising. In Uganda, if nothing is done, will more than double within the next decade. It's also sad to note as a resource link or as a low income country, we contribute to the greatest um, number of premature deaths that are, are estimated at over 85 percent and that when we talk of premature death it's the young people between 30 to 60. so populations living in poverty have an added burden from the ncdis we already know the top five diabetes hypertension cancer and so forth but there are also the other 
NCDIs that not to prioritize, but are actually contributing a big burden to the poor populations. And the commission was established to strengthen ongoing efforts to build an investment case for NCDIs. And this in terms of making sure the NCDIs are highlighted, they are prioritized and hopefully attract the funding that they need to effectively carry out their implementation of prevention and control. And the findings and recommendations here will definitely add value to existing efforts to address NCDs. So the commission had objectives to establish the burden of disease for NCDIs, um, stratifying them by socioeconomic groups, understand the availability and coverage of their services, prioritize among the conditions, prioritize the cost-effective interventions, and also estimate about how much it will cost us to, to achieve our target of 65% universal health coverage by 2030. So we worked as um, partnerships again across institutions in government, clinicians, academia, research, NGO, civil society, uh, WHO, and yeah, different surveillance sites, as you can see listed on the left. And on the right, we looked at different sources, uh, desk review of different documents, the surveys, the routine data, and then the model data. So what we found, um, is that the NCDIs in Uganda contribute a large burden, a large share of the burden of NCDIs, sorry, the large burden of disease in Uganda. And you can see from this global burden of disease data that in the last two decades, NCDs have actually moved up. So the 37% of DALIs, 41% of all deaths were due to NCDIs and the relative burden has increased, has doubled actually. And you can see the green, um, yes, this is for communicable maternal and child health conditions. So they, are, they were high, they are still high, but definitely coming down with all the investment efforts. So we don't want to wait until we reach that level because even with what is happening currently, there's still not enough resources to even do the little we can. So it's just good to know that. Yeah, they can actually make, there will be, diff, there can be a difference in the trend if the right investment is done. We also found that the proportion of deaths due to major disease, major diagnosis of NCDs, NCDs contribute actually to a large proportion of deaths. So, and this is even for sites such as Iganga Mayuge that are considered rural or peri-urban, for example, where you'd expect that people have access to fruits in their trees and they are active, they go to the garden, they fetch water, they don't drive cars, they don't have traffic jam, but you can still see that NCDs, that is the brown and the gray, that's injuries labeled as external, are quite huge and it's still kind of the trend is kind of similar to what we look, uh, what we are looking at at the national level. We also found from the GBD 2017 is that the DALIs, that is the um, burden of disease, men's cities and injuries under 40 in Uganda is actually more. So if you look at the green is for under 40s, looking at non I mean the other non-communicable diseases and injuries, because injuries are part of it as well. You can see that we actually had, sorry about that. You can see that we had 56% of NCD DALIs and 70% of injuries estimated to occur below 40 years. So as we are still thinking of inviting Global Fund to the partnership table, it's good to let them know that the younger population is actually rapidly joining the age bracket or the cohort. So we also found that the proportion of the, the DALI steel from NCDIs in Uganda is actually greater for the non-traditional NCDs. So for example, our national efforts are focusing on the top five D, diabetes, cancer, cardiovascular disease, and so forth. But we can see on the left, which is gray, that the other nine five plus five conditions, which are quite a number, contribute to even a bigger burden, which is about 
We also found that the crude death rates by wealth quintile in Iganga Mayuke was higher in the poorest. So you can actually see from the graph from the poorest, poorer, poor, least poor, and least poor, you could see that the NCDs um, had a crude death rate that was almost three times higher in the poorest groups compared to the least poor. So the poor people are not only carrying a huge burden, they are also dying a lot from non-communicable diseases. So if we are thinking universal health coverage, thinking poor people, then it's good to have those figures in mind. So we also found that most of the NCDI deaths occur outside of the health facility. You could see 58% of those recorded from these Iganga Mayuge cohorts still. The proportion was of outside the health facility deaths was actually NCDs at almost 70%. And we noticed that NCDs um, contributed to the highest number of those who die at home. And then communicable diseases contributed to those who die in the facility and accidents contributed to those, uh, to the highest of those who die en route to hospital. It's understandable because yes, accidents usually are acute, people are already traveling and yes, it's possible they can die on the way to the facility. But for NCDs, I think it's important for us to, uh, to wake up or to open our eyes more. If we thought that the figures we see at the health facilities are enough to point to what uh, the case load is, then let also re let's also realize that there are actually many more people dying at home from NCDs and they don't even reach the facility. So it means what we are seeing may not actually be the best um, estimates to reflect what the situation is on ground. So when we looked at the proportion of health facilities offering NCDI services. We realized that the, the region of the higher level facilities, of course, had better services compared to lower level. The privates had better than public, the urban had better than rural. And for the regions, the southwestern had, midwestern had, uh, had the highest, followed by Kampala, and the lowest was in Karamoja. But what was important, what is important to note is that. Um, when we think of access or universal access, these graphs should not really be having a very divergent or a very a deep variation of the curves. They should almost be at a close range if we are doing something that is um, helpful, especially for the poor and those in remote areas. So we also looked at availability of essential services for NCDs. And we could see that the health facilities, sorry, the, the, the essential medicines for, drug, for conditions like TB, malaria, HIV, were a lot higher compared to those for the NCDs, which were actually below 30%. And then we also see the green, that is, these are the NCD medications, are actually, yeah, in very few facilities compared to those that had drugs for TB, HIV, and malaria. And that is a um, national level. So for expenditure, we, we noted that yes, spending for NCDs is still low in Uganda. And as I mentioned earlier, it's definitely the case across, but you can see that infectious diseases, reproductive health, yes, took a big share and NCDs and injuries had something very small, but what is important note that NCDs and injuries actually had the highest out-of-pocket expenses. So if we are looking at protecting our populations and not making them poorer, we want to go to middle income status, you have vision 2040 where we want to improve household income and so forth. We should realize that health expenditure, especially for NCDs is one of those um, factors that might hinder our goal. So Dr. Maggie, you can inform the president in the next round table. So the recommendations, we said in order to achieve universal health coverage, we need an expanded NCDI agenda. So we looked at a number of conditions and we looked, um, we used evidence-based priority setting matrices to come up with this list. 
it's not that we, we need a lot more NCDs to address. We already have the five top NCDs we are looking at and we are not even doing enough, but we still cannot pretend to ignore the big burden that comes from all these other non-prioritized NCDs. And so the task of this commission was also to highlight them. And for example, for planning purposes, of course, if you want for universal health coverage, every condition should be able to access, I mean, yeah, patients with any condition should be able to access services whenever they need, when they need them. But in the, in the case of you know, limited resources where we need to see what to prioritize, at least we have a pool of conditions to look at from each of these categories. Details of all these are in the report. So we recommended, yeah, the second recommendation was that there are evidence-based interventions available that we can use to prevent and treat, manage NCDIs, but they need to be implemented. They exist, yes, we need to find more evidence-based intervention, but at least for those that we know are there and already work, we also need to have them implemented. We need more investment, we need greater emphasis on prevention and screening for early diagnosis. Most of our patients come late to facilities. And um, of course, if they knew better how to prevent the diseases, if they had the information, then maybe they will not even fall sick in the first place. And uh, we know that NCDs are called silent killers because you can carry them around for a while without knowing. So I think it's even more critical to make sure the population is aware. Multi-sectoral action, we've talked about partnerships. That cannot be overemphasized. It's definitely a requirement. And we also need high quality data to help us make um, informed decisions for NCD control. So as I conclude, I, I wanted to look at this more from the perspective of reflection. And that is for all of us in our different capacities as researchers, as health workers, as investors, as government, as Ministry of Health, as advocates. NCDI um, already has existing partnership or needs partnerships at various levels, but what is actually being done? What can be done? So they may be existing partnerships, yes, but how effective are they? What are they doing? How are they helping us close the gaps um, from the UHC perspective or from the perspective of prevention, whatever, uh, angle we choose to look at it. How are they helping us address gaps with access to medications? Are they helping us address gaps with maybe investigations for cases when patients come to facility? How do we build more partnerships? I know we have partnerships, but they may not be um, to the level that we, we need or to match the demand. How do we build more partnerships? How do we sustain them? And what lessons can we learn from other partnerships and programs like the public-private partnerships and HIV programs and so forth, or like from business people who have had successful partnerships. And um, at the bottom here, I had just put different perspectives. There's the policy level, research, advocacy, health services, and community. At policy level, this report, for example, has given us good evidence-based strategies to inform policy and strategies and plans. It has identified useful gaps that need further research to answer. It is a good tool that we can use to lobby for NCD prioritization and increased funding. And of course, it has recommended strengthening capacity for health services, integration. Uh, it has also recommending, um, recommended prevention and how we can engage the community and having people families, persons, communities meaningfully participate in the prevention and control efforts, especially when it comes to lifestyle. The question is, how do we do all this? What role can partnerships play? We know they have a role, but how exactly do we make use of those partnerships so that they are able to make a difference in the, control, in the efforts to prevent and control NCDs in our country? And that is how I conclude my presentation for today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anne. I think that was an excellent presentation and especially on your reflections about the gaps in our partnerships. Uh, we may have partnerships, but how are they uh, working? Are they working anyway? And what are they doing to 
to control and manage these non-communicable diseases. I think they, they are good reflections for us to think about. We may come here, talk, we have formed partnerships, but what are they doing exactly and how are we controlling uh, the non-communicable diseases? I think that was an excellent presentation and that marks the end of our presentations. Thank you for being a very, very good audience. Thank you for having very excellent presentations. I now give an opportunity for any questions, any comments to the audience. Uh, if you have uh, written your uh, question, it's fine. But if you can raise your hand and you want to have a comment, we still have a few minutes, maybe five minutes or less. Uh, we can give you an opportunity. Thank you, Gerard. Uh... There is a question in the in the true and the A. Maybe Isaac has your, your, your comment on it and then we can receive other questions. Any ideas how can how we can let the community become more aware of NCDs so that they can catch it early or maybe they can be diagnosed early? He's asking any idea. I think he, yes. Yeah, you can start with that. Yeah, I, I can start with that. It's actually, two comments. So, yeah, community. Community actually is the is, it was one of the biggest uh, place to start. Uh, like you, you you've seen in the uh, Mayuge uh, work, the big bulk of things happen in the community, and you're not aware. Of course, partnerships. Like we involved in groups where we are out there trying to promote community engagement and learning from how they infectious colleagues, uh, disease uh, clinicians have done it, where they actually uh, they emphasize in community engagement, uh, where people look out for each other, uh, screenings, diagnosis are happening in, in there, uh, using radio, media, to kind of publicize this. Uh, uh, Dr. Magichi goes mentioned uh, something that was, was catchy, uh, and we know this. The, the, the initially, these diseases are not uh, they're, they're not, you don't feel anything, they are symptomatic. We, we need to engage, engage communities, not to focus on the fevers. Even when you have a fever, can they look out for other things? And of course, this spills to uh, the, the VHTs that are out there. Uh, some are, are doing blood pressure checks, BP checks, educating people about prevention and early detection. We can do it actually at the community level because by the time they reach us, for example, I uh, told you I work with the Uganda Institute, Institute it, it might be too late and we need more resources to make sure we treat this one person. But if we go down there and be able to advocate, encourage, that, that would be great. I'm a patron of the patient support group for America disease. And one of our vision actually is to demystify some of these things uh, where they go out, they do visits, they educate, uh, they've recently done a video to kind of demystify this, how it started, the challenges that we pick, can we learn from them and be able to actually uh, contain this? But everybody needs to know and at the community level that these NCDs are a challenge. And once they become overt, they are really expensive uh, to, to manage. Uh, somebody say, like, mentioned something about uh, NCDs, uh, it's, 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 it's the large scope of NCD, also an obstacle to tackle how the disease is effectively. Of course, th yes, but to an extent, uh, we, 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 we know that if we integrate care, one of the organizations I work for, it's integrated care. There, there is a lot that you can actually do when you integrate. There's a lot of cost savings. We're learning it from HIV. They, are in, they integrate uh, uh, TB, uh, they integrate HIV care. Now actually we're partnering with them to integrate uh, non-communicable diseases because there is an establishment already. They have the resources, they have the infrastructure. How do you bring these so that you can approach uh, things with uh, an integrated care? Of course, at, at the top level, for example, at the regional referral, national referral, it might be hard to run everything together, but at the lower level, can we actually have integrated way of, of caring? Because it would be sad to have a patient who has diabetes, you see them on Monday, on Wednesday they come for their hypertension, and then on Friday they come back because of a stroke. Can we have these seen in one clinic and everything is looked at? That will save costs, but also it will be an encouragement because uh, polypharmacy, multiple drugs, but if you have a team that's dedicated to treat them, that actually saves uh, costs for them. 
uh, and, 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 and that's the way to go. Uh, yes, yeah. so the, the other comment actually I wanted to make was, uh, you know, these partnerships as we look at them, I liked uh, Dr. Idro, how, how, how we put it, you know, competency, engagement, willingness, uh, it takes time, one step at a time, uh, never despise humble beginnings because even the best of the best, they started somewhere. There's that inertia to start things, but can we mobilize ourselves and start somewhere and keep moving and be committed to this? Uh, it's good we have this report. It's a great tool. We want to run with it and we will encourage many partners actually to join forces that will be able to respond to those gaps that are there. Some of them might be huge, but if we start somewhere, we'll be able to tackle them. Trust. Uh, accountability, these resources that come, how well do we use them? So I will gain more trust and then more comes our way uh, and perseverance and, 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 and multiple level engagement, uh, pharma, uh, uh, technology. Recently, we are doing M Health, e Health, because especially in this pandemic, we can't reach our patients, but platforms like e Health are coming in handy to kind of help provide integrated package. Yes, thank you so much. There is a question for Dr. Uebok. How can Siemens Health Seniors, Health Government, support regional referral hospitals with diagnostic imaging tools like CT scans from Dr. Ponyai? First of all, thank you very much for the, thank you for, for very much for the question. I think it's all communication. Please, after the after the after the session, please reach out to me, and then we can we can discuss in detail what 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 is needed and where 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 we where we, we can assist. There's not a one fits for all approach, but I think the most important thing is that we understand what the requirements are, what the needs are, and what's what's what the possibilities are. So I don't know whether you're. Through through this panel, you're sharing emails or something. I don't know how this works, but uh, I'm happy. Please reach maybe out to can, me. Maybe you can share your email in the in, in the chat room or on, on Q and A. But thank you very much. Thank you very much, our presenters. Uh, our time is well spent. Thank you very very much, our listeners, the participants. This has been a well attended session with good presentations. I want to thank you. And I hope we have learned something about partnerships and how to move them forward. I think there's a lot to reflect on. Uh, the conversation will continue among us and our partners. I want to really thank you once again and tell you that keep safe, especially those in Uganda. We are in the second wave of this COVID pandemic. And uh, I request that we take care uh, of yourselves and your families to avoid uh, getting the, the COVID. I thank you very much. And unless there is a very urgent announcement, I wanted to close this session. Bye -bye. Any of the presenters who would want to say something? Uh, Dr. Mtunji, I think there are some two unanswered questions on the chat room. I, want to have a look. I see there are comments. That's why I didn't bother. I don't see any questions. Okay. Okay. Maybe the last one. What is the proportion of funding do the consortia put in ready education programs in the countryside? I don't think I get to understand the question. But yes, the, the radios and the other media platforms in the countryside are good to media to reach the people, but we have not, we don't have the funding yet, and there's not there's no consortia to talk about. But you know, uh, a journey of a thousand miles starts with one step. Okay. Any comments uh, from us? Um, yes. I just want to thank the participants. We had a very good, uh, large group of participants. Thank you for attending, and I hope we were able to add value. And I also thank my fellow speakers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the, uh, we end from here.